as you may have guessed from that nonsense, we are doing the August reading wrap-up. So I read six books in August. Uh, these two were rereads uh, because I needed to read the new Karen McManus, which honestly I think my best read the whole month was my reread of One of Us is Lying. It's been a disappointing month. Let's start off with Girl in Pieces. So this book was a little difficult to read, uh, not because of the subject matter, but because it felt like nothing was really happening. The plot felt like it was going in a bit of a spiral, the pace was inconsistent, some parts moved very quickly and some parts moved very slowly. There were connections that didn't quite connect, some of the characters felt underdeveloped and vague while still expecting us to connect with them. There are also several chunks of the book featuring an excess of italicized words. Italicization to the point where it feels like random words are being italicized rather than formatting them for emphasis. It doesn't read well in those sections at all and it's hard to keep track of what's being said or what's important. Italicizing words for emphasis is great, but too much of it takes away from which words are supposed to have emphasis or importance. On top of this, the ending didn't feel like it really wrapped up properly. It had the opportunity to be a perfect tie-up, but instead opened up new questions and ideas that went nowhere. There were definitely aspects of the book I found interesting and enjoyed a little bit overall. I wasn't that impressed. This was a three-star read for me. One of Us is Lying. This was a reread. It was a five star for me. Uh, I decided I wanted to refresh my memory of the events of the first two books before reading the new one. Uh, while I did remember a lot of this one specifically, including who did it, there were a lot of smaller details I'd forgotten. It was also good to have an excuse to reread this because it's been a few years and because of the specific patch of time that I'd originally read them. I don't have much memory from that point in time, so it's all a bit muddled. Uh, this is a YA mystery thriller that starts off kind of like The Breakfast Club, but with murder. This book follows four main characters who were in detention with Simon when he died. They're all hiding secrets, and now they're all suspects in his death. All four of these are point of view characters, showing a couple per chapter and alternating throughout the book. With this, we get hints and insights into what might be going on. While the rest of the school starts treating them differently, they decide to team up and try to solve the mystery and clear their names. One of us is next. This, again, was a reread, and it was also five stars. The second book in the series. Um, though I didn't remember this one half as well as the first, which could be partly due to the series completely changing the plot and the characters and the details in every possible way. This one follows a new group of students, three friends, one of which is the younger sister of Bronwyn from the original group. Now, an anonymous texter has started a game with the students of Bayview High, a deadly game of truth or dare. While the original group makes a few appearances, the new trio are rushing to track down the person responsible for the game. The point of view follows these three characters, one per chapter, as well as a few snippets of news reports. One of us is back. This one was only four stars for me. I was actually very disappointed in this book, especially after waiting all year for it. This has been one of my most anticipated books of this year, and it let me down. It let me down. This book has point of view chapters for three characters, two of which are from the original group and one from the second. Though all of the characters from both groups and their partners and a few side characters are also present. It has flashback chapters for Jake and Simon six years earlier as well, which was an interesting feature. While I did enjoy this book and the insight into the Simon-Jake relationship, I didn't enjoy it as much as the first two. There was a lot more character-based plot in this book and not much thriller mystery based plot. While there were a few hints of something happening, they often didn't come up for a large chunk and seemed to take a backseat to everything going on with the characters in their personal lives. It did have moments that felt like they were on a similar level to the previous books, but overall it didn't have the same connection and it felt at times like it was trying to do too many things at once. 
possibly partly due to the 10 plus characters whose stories are being kept track of and wrapped up. There was definitely a patch where everything came together and piled up towards the end in a typical explosion of excitement, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't disappointed with the ending and this book as a whole. The Midnight Kittens. This was a two star for me. This was one of my 12 this year, and believe me when I tell you, it is not at all what I was expecting when I picked it up. I saw this book and I thought, ooh, a cute children's book about kittens. Reading books that came out in the 1970s really shows how much things have changed. There is no way even half the content mentioned in this book would get published today. We'll come back to that. The book follows... 10-year-old twins, Pam and Tom, home at Graham's house during a short school break. One night, while watching for the hedgehogs to come eat the food they'd set out, a group of four kittens appears. Right at midnight. Pam, with her wild imagination, believes the kittens are magic. Sounds exciting, right? But despite the title, the kittens are barely present throughout the book. Out of 119 pages, the kittens only come up twice, very briefly. Three times if you count the end, but they're still only spoken about in those last few pages, not actually present. On top of this, the plot was a little all over the place. Too many things were happening in such a short time. They're visiting an abandoned house before it gets remodeled to be an antique store. They're off to have tea and visit an almost 100-year-old lady who tells them about a secret room in the abandoned house. They're running around after dark to find a lost treasure and befriending a group of squatters, and somehow, in all of this, they're thinking about the kittens who seem to turn up at midnight on the dot. I did find the topics of discussion from the children quite interesting for their age. Only four pages in, and they were talking about drugs, following on to the next page with a paragraph of Graham thinking about smoking. There was also a discussion and several mentions of atheism, a discussion about vegetarianism and veganism, a quote that went, If the whole human race was wiped out, we'd be saved a powerful lot of suffering. They talked briefly about inflation and rising costs. This came up several times. Almost being hit by a car and one of them saying, It's coming jolly fast and it's swaying. I should think it's being driven by someone drunk. And a few mentions from another adult character of abuse, drug addiction, and divorce. Some of these are worse than others, of course, but keeping in mind that these are discussions by 10-year-old kids doesn't really feel like it quite fits. Guess what finally came out in Australia? <laughs> Hell Followed With Us, which was a four-star read for me. I found this book confusing to begin with, as the main character refers to a religious cult that calls themselves angels, but at this point we have no mention of who or what they are. I was struggling to understand if this was referring to actual angels or a group of people. The book follows Benji, who is a trans guy, um, who has managed to escape from a religious group that, in an attempt to cleanse the world, genocide essentially, created and unleashed an apocalyptic virus that turns people into monsters. He stumbled into a group of teens from an LGBTQ plus youth center who take him in as one of their own, not knowing that he's been forcibly injected with a different strain of the virus and doesn't have much time left. It's basically a YA horror about religious trauma, and it seems to use these virus-spawned monsters as a way to symbolize being queer. For the most part, it was pretty cool. There are a lot of character introductions all bunched very close together, which means a lot of descriptions and pronouns and all of that to remember all at once, which gets kind of confusing especially when some of those characters are mentioned and don't come up again for another 50 pages, so we don't see enough to remember. As opposed to breaking it up and introducing them when they're relevant and making it easier to know who is who. It feels like there was just this need to get all of it out and dump out who everyone was all at once, even though only a few of them mattered at the time. Aside from the obvious content warnings for religion, religious trauma, and transphobia, I'd also add a content warning for alcohol or drinking, which is in one scene, and a content warning for dental trauma, which is a few pages and several mentions at other points. This book has big patches where it somehow manages to make it feel like there's no plot while also having a very distinct plot. My main issue with this book is a lot harder to explain. There were moments in which Benji kind of zoned out and saw things in a different scene, things that were not happening where he was but also appeared to be at a different point in time. 
These were brushed off as visions and not really addressed. But in one particular scene, it's playing out in this fantasy land while also playing out in real life. When it's following Benji's point of view, we have this very different version of events, but when we snap back to Nick's point of view, we can see what's happening with the monsters and the rot and all of that. The way this is written is confusing and didn't feel as though it was done well. It felt like a shortcut to avoiding writing the point of view of the monsters, and it didn't fit with what was happening around it. It was also never explained and may as well have never happened. Aside from that, I did enjoy reading the book. It certainly had interesting ideas and themes that aren't often presented in traditionally published work, but I'm not sure I'd be inspired to read any more work by the author. So that is it. These are the books I read in August and what I thought of them. Have you read any of these? And did you like them? Uh, what books did you get up to reading in August and what was your favourite? Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Happy reading and stay awesome.